Oh my god! <laughs> oh my fuck! Oh fuck! I love you too! Up today for our first topic is actually our favorite game. So what we're doing is we're doing kind of a top five list in no particular order. And uh, we'll see, see how it pans out here. And of course, you guys can chime in down in the comments or on any of our social media pages uh, for your choices as well. So let's get right into this, as they say. Um, I'll let you go first. So one of my favorite games of all time is Diablo 2. Probably the Lord of Destruction expansion as well. It kind of showed my, piqued my interest in RPGs. Kind of showed me what it's like to grind levels for equipment and it really just changed my opinion on online gaming in general. It's kind of interesting to always form a group with people and just try to get the best equipment or... <laughs> Sorry, our roommate is just... <laughs> yeah, we're doing this right now. But anyways. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was just kind of an interesting time in my life as well. Going through high school and trying to, I don't know, find games and shit that kind of yeah. like got me through life, I guess, too. Yeah, and I mean, I was never that big into Diablo 2. It wasn't exactly my style of game, but uh, from what I did play, like I did really enjoy the music in it as well. Um, and yeah. we're probably going to talk about some more Blizzard games here, but uh, definitely one, one of my favorite composers there doing that game. So... Yeah, it's definitely a great choice. And from what I've played, the level design, the bosses, um, the way the systems worked and everything, again, not my style of game, but I can definitely respect it and I understand why that's such a yeah, like popular a, game. Yeah, a very world-renowned game for yeah. RPGs, that's for sure. Yeah. I guess uh, one of my favorite games of all time would still be Doom 1, uh, the original Doom 1 as well. The main thing about it is, one, it's still holds up today like it's one of those games that's purely based on gameplay itself uh there isn't some crazy story to it it's just the systems worked perfectly um it was consistent and it still had a lot of elements that games today even don't have and then i wish that more games would implement um, for example secret areas having like a shooter that's all about balls to the wall big guns, shooting demons, but also kind of an intricate puzzle game and mind game at the same time. And that's something that, that keeps that game interesting and gives it replayability. It's also, when you play it on nightmare mode, one of the most difficult games I've ever played still to this day. Um, I mean, I'm definitely not the best gamer out there, but definitely still challenges me a lot. Um, and yeah, I mean, the fact that it still holds up today just kind of speaks for itself. So I think it's also a master in level design as well. Yeah, just kind of help the difficulty and also still keep it rememberable. For yeah, lots of memorable mo moments in there too. Yeah. But yeah, it's definitely, definitely one of my favorite. What about you? Have another pick there? My set, one of my other favorite games of all time would probably be Metroid Prime. Same thing, kind of almost for a lot, same thing on like the Doom thing where it's got very memorable level design. Kind of changed my opinion on storytelling. It's very, if you've ever played it, you have to like scan items, researching stuff that way. Kind of gives you a different opinion on how to look at a level or whatever. You're going in, trying to find the best ways to beat an enemy and then you can scan them, understand how to beat them with the visor. And then afterwards, you can scan some of the artifacts and stuff, and it kind of gives you kind of like a feet, like a good atmosphere on the, the planet you're on, and also the enemies you're fighting, what they're there for, if they're indigenous or not. So yeah, that was that's probably one of my favorite things. The combat combat system was pretty simple; it was still fairly effective as well. But yeah, it was a very as atmospheric game to say the least awesome music as well it really gets you into that atmosphere so yeah it was a really nice game that way yeah and i mean what do you think of like, again i'm not a huge 
Uh, I've never really delved too much into the Metroid Prime series, but like the latest games that came out in the franchise, do you think that they kind of lived up to what Metroid Prime has done, or? Are you talking about Other you... M? <laughs> yeah, specific. Other M was kind of a different monster. I don't know, I didn't personally like it, but if you ask pretty much anyone who thought Met Metroid Prime was a game changer, they'll probably tell you the same thing. Yeah. I don't know, they kind of went a different approach, kind of more like cinematic, kind of like how a lot of games are. Yeah. Kind of like, like with cinematic deaths where you like go up behind them and like shoot them in the head or try to like knife them in the back kind of stuff, which kind of, I think took away from kind of like the feeling you got out of Metroid Prime. Yeah. But at the same time, it was an interesting game, but I don't know, I preferred Metroid Prime because I don't know, it kind of brought me into a genre that I've never really into understood as well yeah. as I did when I first played it. So I don't know, it kind of changed my opinion on level design. A game that at first glance looks like a, a shooter, but it is kind of like a puzzle game where you're trying to find certain items to like improve your character. So you can like get a double jump when at first you don't. Well, I guess technically you do, you lose it all, but. <laughs> you, Great way to start. Yeah. You go on the planet, you try to find items, obviously, to improve your character. So you try to get your morph ball, your spire ball, so you can attach on the special railings, stuff like that. So it was kind of interesting like, going back and forth from level, like parts of the planet to get better equip, like equipment for your suit. So yeah, it was kind of interesting. It al also, it kind of helps you along sometimes. Obviously, if you're totally clueless and you're just running around like a weirdo, <laughs> you can't, you obviously, it helps you out. So, yeah, that was nice as well. But it should be interesting if they uh, bring out a new one on the rumored Nintendo oh, system, but that's that's I another topic so. for, <laughs> for another I day, so. I guess. <laughs> uh, but anyways, um, another choice for me, a uh, game that I played recently, a game that came out recently that really kind of changed or introduced me to a new genre of games that's also pretty recent. But the game I'm talking about is Life is Strange and the storytelling in that game and how it's done is something that I've never seen in a game before. It's very much like a TV show in terms of, as you may know, it has five episodes to it. Each episode kind of ends on not necessarily a cliffhanger, but um, it basically introduces you to the next episode and yeah you just I played it all in one go but I imagine if you had to wait for the next episode every time it'd be very similar to watching a tv series and just being like no I need to know what happens next so that part <laughs> was really interesting and also the story was extremely emotional I thought um and I think everyone that's played that game kind of agrees and it's just something so unique I definitely recommend if you're looking for like a story based game that is definitely a game to look into because it's crazy. The music in it was awesome. Like the indie artists that they chose to do the music within the game. Um, I basically downloaded like all of them. It was just whoever's the music supervisor <laughs> on that game, I thought did an awesome job with awesome. that. Um, but yeah, the story, you know, starts out just being kind of about life as a teenager uh, and it delves into some really crazy shit towards the end. So. Definitely, definitely changed my perspective on story-based games. On that game, could you change like how the story goes based on your yeah. options? As yeah, well? so that's actually a big part of it. It does differ, so for every character you talk to, the choices you make, that all kind of changes. Or affects your, how the next episode is Exactly, play. yeah. So in terms of replayability, there's also a large chunk there, but there's so many choices you run into where you're just like, oh God, I hope I make the right decision because if not, uh, this whole thing is going to get screwed over. And uh, most of the time, it, it just, you, you can't, really, there isn't really a good or bad choice. You just kind of go with it. And if you think you've made a big mistake, it might turn out good or bad, who knows. Um, but it's definitely one of those things where when a choice pops up on the screen, you start sweating and you're like, oh God. 
uh, and thank God it doesn't have a timer on it because even without the timer, it's really intense making the choices in that game. And that's something that I think adds to how intense and emotional the game is because once you get connected to the characters and you have to make those choices, it's, it's pretty crazy. So life is strange, definitely some may say it's a walking simula simulator, but it's, it's crazy. Like definitely check it out. Definitely check it out. Yeah. Cool. Cool. So I'm going to go into my next one, Trackmania Nations actually. Oh yeah. <laughs> which might be kind of a surprise to some people because uh, I don't think it's a hugely popular game in the United States and but Canada. But in Europe it definitely is and other parts of the world. So, yeah. But yeah, it was, it was a very interesting game. It kind of changed my opinion on racing games because most racers, if you have played most like Forza, Mario, even Mario Kart or Dirt or any of those, it's kind of like you always go around in, I guess, a circle or an oval in interesting ways, to say the least. But most of the time, it's very like three laps, four laps, whatever the, yeah. they want to put the laps as. But track meet and nation's kind of changed my opinion on how you can get to A to B. It's also a very physics based game. So drifting and jumping can totally change on based on how you throttle brake the a train the train they have great amounts of train yeah. from asphalt grass dirt even the air can change how things go so yeah it was kind of it's a very interesting game based on how even the community built maps because you first can play the multiplayer it's kind of it gradually gets more difficult the more you go into the metals and series. So to go into the multiplayer where you can get on like servers that can go from very competitive, really tight courses to just straight on go as fast as you can around some crazy courses with turbos and uh, roller coaster type loop-de-loops and stuff so it's kind of kind of crazy that way so yeah like the one thing i'll say is like in track mania it's really the only racing game i know that has these crazy tracks with like loop-de-loops and gravity track i mean track mania nations itself didn't have gravity tracks but um the series is just known for having crazy over the top circuits yeah. like you're going faster than I can see you're going around crazy turns loops yeah. um, it's definitely one of those things that I'm sad that more North Americans don't really know about the game um, or have never played it and maybe in part that's because it was always just on PC and also wasn't very popular here but um, yeah it's one of those games that's it's very over the top yeah and it's it's an arcade game that's like harder than most racing <laughs> simulators like it's crazy yeah um, it's and also a game that you have to take with kind of like almost with a pinch of salt when you first start it because yeah. it is a very, it is not a very easy game to say the least for a racing game. You have to, I know when I first played it, I took multiple and I'm talking multiple tries to even get like maybe even silver or gold. Yeah. So yeah, it's a very hard game, but once you actually start understanding the physics behind it, understand the driving, it can get a lot better. Yeah, and what, you'll appreciate it more, I guess, too. What makes it addicting, too, is you're not just racing against other people, but you're racing against the clock. So everybody's racing to get the fastest times on the track, um, whether you're in campaign or online. And <laughs> to get the fastest time on these tracks or to get the gold medals on these tracks, you have to basically find out every nook and cranny of the physics of the yeah. game. Like it's really just about redoing it like a hundred times and you're gonna be frustrated, but yeah. eventually. It's very, very trial and error as well. Like yes. you can get on some maps where the difference between making it and not making it is drifting around a corner or slowing down enough to make a wide turn around a corner. So yeah, it's very trial and error. And I think that's another reason why it was a really good game is because your personality could also transfer over to the game so how you wanted the race could kind of differ based on other people. 
which is also nice. And yeah, it's, it was just a really good game. Next pick would probably be Half-Life 2. So Half-Life 2 is one of those games, obviously it at this point almost seems generic to say it's one of your favorite games, but it's a great game. Uh, that's the bottom line. So story driven, gameplay wise, what it did with the first person shooter franchise. There's so much to love about Half-Life 2. So one of my favorite things is that it told a story that I think is better than still most games today. And it told it without any cinematic. So everything was just through walking up to a character and then that character would start talking to you in a way that it was kind of like in a cinematic fashion, but you could still walk around. So even though you were kind of locked in one space, it, you weren't taking out of the experience because you were still playing that game. You weren't watching a cutscene. So I thought that was done really cleverly. And that was, <laughs> that was years ago. Like, I mean, I don't know how, like Half-Life 2 came out in like 2006 or something. Yeah, um, probably 10 years ago. Yeah, so it's, it's about time for the Half-Life 3. <laughs> oh, <my> God. <laughs> Just can't wait, but if that ever happens. Um, obviously, the graphics at the time, I remember Doom 3 came out around the same time and Fear, uh, First Encounter Assault Recon. And all three of the games, Half-Life, Fear, and Doom, at the time had like kind of top-notch graphics on the PC platform. And I think Half-Life 2 also definitely took, took it home for that. Like the lighting system, the, the physics were crazy. Like that was one thing in the gameplay where um, obviously there was a lot of puzzles in that game. But like you could use yeah. the saw blades to cut people in half or uh, the gravity gun was like a huge implementation to that game and kind of a really unique idea at the time. Um, and I mean, Valve is really good at making unique weapons. Um, but that was definitely a game that kind of nailed it on that and combining physics, first person shooter mechanics, storytelling, level design, uh, sound design, you, like it just nailed almost every category. And I think that's why yeah. it's still one of the most renowned games. Yeah, yeah. If you brought it up, it probably nailed it at the time. Yeah. And even maybe even still today, like the source engine obviously holds up yeah. pretty damn well. It's been pretty much used almost as much if Valve allowed you to use it as much as almost the Unreal Engine, so. Yeah, I mean, Titanfall was built on Source Engine, right? So, so. I mean, and even playing Half-Life 2, the exact one on high settings today, like obviously it's not the most pretty game, but uh, its foundations were so solid that it's still good to look at. It's a gorgeous game still, even if the polygons aren't completely up to date, but the physics and the lighting engine itself were, were really good at the time and that, yeah, the storytelling in that game, phenomenal. I mean, I will admit the first Half-Life 2, the way it ended was a little <laughs> weird. Um, but at the time, I think we weren't sure if we were also going to get the sequels and when we were going to get them. So once you got Episode 1 and Episode 2, um, it kind of completed it. And now that I have it in mind with those episodes, um, definitely not a complete story. We're still waiting for the ending, but it also had one of the craziest cliffhangers at the end there. But... Um, yeah, a real like game it. changer. It was, it definitely was. It, <laughs> yeah, it changed FPS for me at least, like um, in terms of storytelling, especially. So, you know, hmm. what about cool. you? Uh, I have yet to sadly play a Half Life <laughs> game, which I plan to change in the near future, but I don't know. It seems like everyone talks about Half Life somehow or some way. So, yeah, it was. I don't think it only changed shooters. I think it changed RPS game or RPG games in general. Anything with first person shooter probably got changed somehow from Half Life. So yeah, yeah. So the Valve definitely knows what they're doing there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think we can probably talk about one of the games that are both one of that made both our lists for the top five. Um, and I let you start on that one. It would be StarCraft Brood War. It kind of revolution, I think in almost two separate ways for both of us. But at the same time, it still had kind of like almost a... Nowadays, it can be... Back then, it would be kind of weird to say this, but nowadays, it's like almost like a Game of Thrones type of yeah. political story. Yeah. So it was a very interesting game that way. Did a lot of backstabbing. 
a lot of crazy shit going on with Kerrigan, Rayner, Phoenix, and the like. So, yeah, it was kind of a crazy political campaign, which it started off really cool. It always kind of had a purpose and then kind of a weird, crazy twist to be had some point. So, campaign-wise, it was a very interesting game with epic music to go along with oh yeah the music like i just bought the soundtrack the other day it's <laughs> it's awesome like just the atmosphere that they built for that game like both in in game like the way they built the terran uh universe the zerg kind of look um the protoss look and then they the, they actually combine that with the music to make some of my most memorable like scenes and just visions in gaming like when I think of, like now when I think of future space or humans in space, I think of like Terrans from, from StarCraft, right? Um, and yeah. the way they designed their spaceships and, and platforms and stuff. So like they did a really good job with the artwork on that game and it still holds up. Uh, StarCraft is a very kind of artwork driven game in terms of like its visual design. So even yeah. the older games, like obviously, even though they're like uh, not necessarily 2D, but uh, like they obviously don't look very modern. Yeah, but the graphics <laughs> engines they used weren't obviously yeah. super powerful, but still the... doesn't hinder the gameplay yeah. at all, and it still looks gorgeous, yeah. right? So um, in terms of art design, like... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the one thing that also kind of changed my opinion on most games or whatever from StarCraft is... The three fa fraction factions fraction <laughs> factions is uh, math. <laughs> is that all of them felt extremely different, but somehow worked because of it? <laughs> Hi, Alex. Oh. <laughs> so in that way, it was kind of interesting. In that, obviously, Zergs are very swarmy. They they're little guys that cost little little amounts mm -hmm. so you could build a lot of them and swarm someone protoss big bulky units very powerful costs a lot oh my god oh man anyways so the terran obviously human race Got a lot of tanks, artillery, infantry, spaceships. So yeah, it was a very interesting game in that everything had like a, a purpose and a direction on how to be different, but still interact with each other very well. So in and that way, it's pretty good. It's a game that I thought too was, it's very simple, but hard to master. So like, it's easy to get into StarCraft and to kind of understand how it works, yeah. but to really um, beat some of the harder missions or especially online, I mean, online, as many of you may know, is just crazy. Um, but yeah, it's something that's really hard to master. And I'm surprised they balanced the three races as well as they did, because like you're saying, each yeah. race is so different in how they build. Like Terran, you can float your buildings everywhere. You don't, you're not limited to building yeah. in one place. Zerg, you have to make sure you build on creep and that you expand your hatcheries all the time. Yeah, build um, everything out of your hatcheries, all your yeah, units. Yeah, um, and then Protoss, again, you can warp in units anywhere, but you have to make sure that you have pylons in those positions but the pylons aren't limited to any specific area. So it's just the, the fact that they got all of that working as balanced as it is, um, especially when it yeah, comes I down think, to the units and stuff. Yeah. I think Brood War only had like two, two ex patches that really changed like units and how they work. Yeah. So to have a game where it's only two patches and they got it pretty much nailed is pretty crazy in my opinion. Not many other games can say that. So, yeah, and that way it's pretty crazy. And even had like a huge online community of map makers and stuff, probably not as big as Warcraft 3, but still had a lot of maps that people made. So I guess one of my last choices here would be Mass Effect 2. Another story-driven game. As you can tell, I like story-driven games. <laughs> um, can't half-ass a story. Just got to go full out with that. Um, but yeah, so your choices, again, it's a Bioware game. So coming off of KOTOR, 
um, or that series, I guess, mainly is what they were known for. Mass Effect was a present surprise, and Mass Effect 2 really refined a lot of it. And I know the community is kind of split on, like, the hardcore RPG fans, they really favor Mass Effect 1, but I think in terms of game design and gameplay and just the story and universe itself, Mass Effect 2 nailed it in that aspect. Wasn't necessarily a perfect game on all edges, but the, like... Every city you went to felt unique. Every race felt unique. Your character decisions, I thought, really mattered, especially that kind of unexpected final mission where it was, for a lot of people, surprisingly hard to get through if they made the wrong choices. Um, I thought that was really cool. And then the gameplay, like you're mixing kind of a third-person shooter with kind of like magic sci-fi abilities almost. Um, so it gave it a nice twist. And then it had something that I thought was really cool. Um, wasn't really well received in a lot of major reviews I saw, but the game had like a system where you would kind of mine planets. And for a lot of people hmm. that was a, like, I don't know, like a boring process maybe, but I really liked it because you couldn't really see exactly where to mine. So it was like a uh, process you had to kind of test out, but. Trial it helped you yeah exactly yeah trial and error and it helped you upgrade and everything so i thought that was just a cool little almost like mini game within the game that i mm. thought worked pretty well um yeah the the music the universe it it, it was all just melded awesome. it melded very well so mass effect 2 definitely one of my favorites still of all time yeah um, mine would last be melee super smash brothers melee it kind of changed my opinion on fighting games, kind of like percentage-based fighting game where you don't actually kill someone from zero, 100 life to zero or whatever the life total is at, on the game. You pretty much have to beat someone off the stage and make sure they fall off the stage or fly it too high enough off the stage that they, they're dying or die. So in that kind of way, it was kind of interesting I've never, no other game really has ever done that. There's some games that are now trying to implement that type of idea, but for a game that's pretty much been out for 16 years with Super Smash or Super Smash Brothers 64, so it's kind of crazy that something with such a weird style with, has such a broad fan base has never seen an implementation of something of that type of system. So that's kind of interesting, in my opinion, a platformer game with percentage. And the cool part is, is that it was a really fun party game. You could go free for all, beat the shit out of your friends <laughs> with some items That's on. Fun. With some items on, with some really memorable characters from the Nintendo universe: Samus, Mario, Pikachu, Luigi. Game and Watch is a fairly old character, which is in it. So, yeah, it was kind of an interesting game and the fact that you could pick your favorite Nintendo characters and beat the crap out of each other. And also it still holds up today, 16-ish years later with the competitive scene that's brought up. So yeah, for a game that at Evo could probably get, probably this year, probably 150 to 200,000 people watching that's the impressive. live event. So. Yeah, it's a pretty crazy game. All right, so we also have some honorable mentions here that we forgot to say. So uh, we both both agreed that probably for us, Halo as a franchise, something that I personally grew up with, yeah. like every sleepover that I went to as like a preteen or teen. Yeah, um, pretty much anyone with an Xbox. Yeah. Pretty Just, much. You always brought it out. I remember it's probably the first game I actually technically did a LAN party with where you actually had two <laughs> Xboxes connected them together and yeah, connected them to separate TV. So it's kind of crazy to think that, yeah, Halo kind of changed my opinion on that too. So yeah. again, yeah. a very well like story driven game yeah. um, with amazing gameplay mechanics. And most importantly, it was something that brought the first person shooter franchise or first person shooter genre to consoles. And it actually worked on the Xbox. With Whereas them. with the yeah. dual uh, stick triggers that yeah. are kind of offset, so awesome job because that no one before Halo had really nailed yeah. that. With a really competitive multiplayer segment with MLG 
kind of brought up MLG really. Yeah, that was true as well. Um, as well, Portal, uh, one of the most fun, uh, most intriguing puzzle games that are also connected to a universe involving Half-Life. So, um, yeah, I yeah. don't know if the... A pretty crazy <laughs> puzzle game that I think not really many people have ever really thought of. Yeah. Kind of like going around in portals that you can pretty much teleport from one side of the room to the next with objects that sometimes you can't go through or can go through. So, yeah. Or with excellent level design. Yeah, I mean, like, especially it got complicated later on with objects that would actually act as well on, like, your movement. So if you portaled onto a beam and then jumped off a wall with bouncy putty on it, like, yeah. it just got pretty crazy and awesome. And, uh, I mean, Portal 2, or the concept for Portal was actually created by, um, I believe, college or university students and then uh, it was a project of theirs and I forgot what the game was called forgive me but um, that was basically what Valve was then inspired by and I believe they hired a couple of those guys from that uh, team as well so um, cool. it was pretty cool